So uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce our grand round speaker today, Dr. Avinash uh, Kambadakoni. Avinash is an associate professor at Harvard Medical School, where he is the division chief of abdominal radiology at Massachusetts General Hospital. He's also the medical director of Martha's Vineyard Hospital Imaging. And I've known Avinash uh, some time now, and I was trying to remember, it's been almost 10 years, and uh, he was just starting out and is attending when I did my fellowship at, uh, at Mass General. Um, and I've been very fortunate, I've been able to keep up with him since then. Um, and we've had a very um, a fruitful friendship. It's been great. Now, to say Avinash is accomplished is an understatement. He's an outstanding clinical radiologist. He's a prolific researcher. He's a sought after educator. He speaks at all the conferences, he's there. <laughs> and he has numerous national leadership roles. Yeah. And so really up to any of the trainees or, or faculty for that matter in the audience, if you're looking to be inspired or emulate a path in radiology, um, I would say you look no further than Avinash, he's terrific. But most importantly, Avinash is kind, he is patient, he is very generous with his time. And one of my great pleasures as division chief has been able, uh, has been my ability to invite speakers, outside speakers that have inspired me, that have mentored me. And Dr. Kambadakoni is, is one such person. So without further ado, uh, please give him a warm virtual welcome to our Yale Grand Rounds. And uh, we'll leave some time for questions at the end. And please use the Q&A text box at the bottom of your screens uh, to ask questions and um, I'll sort of moderate those as we go through them. So Avinash, take it away. Oh, thank you so much, Mahan. Uh, you are too kind. <laughs> I'm trying to search for the person you spoke about just now. You know, <laughs> that doesn't look like, seem like me. Anyway, so uh, let me start uh, with the lecture and you're too kind. And, you know, it's, it's my utmost honor and privilege uh, to speak to all of you today uh, on this fascinating topic of quantitative imaging. And uh, I'm sincerely grateful to Mahan for inviting me and giving me the opportunity. So let me start sharing my screen. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes. One-on-one? -on -one? Uh, yeah, just see uh, your, your opening slide here. Yeah, looks perfect. Perfect. Okay, guys. Uh, yeah, again, thank you so much, Mahan. And uh, I hope I can, uh, this is a huge topic and I hope I can provide some insight into what I have learned about quantitative imaging and how CT can help us in this uh, realm. So these are my disclosures. Uh, before I start, I would like to acknowledge my mentor, fellows, peers, and colleagues uh, who have helped me some of the material for this presentation, especially Anushri Park and Simon Lennertz, my stellar research fellows. And some of the material in this talk was part of an RSNA educational exhibit presented during the 2019 RSNA annual meeting. So in this lecture, uh, I will discuss CT-based quantitative imaging techniques and their role in various existing and emerging clinical applications in the abdomen, focusing on oncology. So let's get started. The picture you see here is the first CT scanner developed by Sir Godfrey Hounsfield, which was purchased for use in the United States. Now, an interesting fact here is that we at MGH were supposed to get this scanner, but the Mayo Clinic beat us to it. So now this scanner is in, now in their museum at the CT Clinical Innovation Center. And this is my proud selfie moment with JG Fletcher and Katie Stockton well before COVID stuck. And thanks to my good friend and colleague, Mike Lev for sharing the story behind this picture. Now, ever since the introduction of CT in the seventies, there have been tremendous advances in the CT scanner technology, ranging from multi-detector CT to dual energy CT, which have provided the impetus for other phenomenal innovations, including various radiation dose reduction strategies, novel software algorithms, volumetric and 3D techniques, newer contrast media with better safety profile. And in the past decade, there has been an emerging interest and extensive research in the exciting field of quantitative imaging. So what is quantitative imaging? If you look at the definition by the Quantitative Imaging Biomarkers Alliance or KIBA, it, quantitative imaging is defined as the extraction of quantifiable features from medical images for the assessment of normal or the severity, degree or change or status of disease, injury or chronic condition relative to the normal. 
quantitative imaging also includes the development, standardization, and optimization of anatomical, functional, and molecular imaging acquisition protocols, data analysis, display methods, and reporting structures. Now here I would, I would like to include, introduce two more definitions relevant to the topic. First is biomarker. Now these are measurable objective characteristics used to assess normal biologic or pathogenic processes. Now there are a wide range of different types of biomarkers in medicine, for example, blood cholesterol levels, body mass index, or tumor markers such as CA99 or CEA, which are extensively used in oncology. Now quantitative imaging biomarker similarly is an objectively measured characteristic derived from in vivo images represented as a ratio or interval scale serving as an indicator of normal biologic pathogenic processes or response to therapeutic intervention. Now it's important to remember that any quantitative imaging biomarker has certain key features which are important from a practical perspective. One is accuracy, that is the accuracy of the measurement to the reference standard indicating that the biomarker should work. For example, if you take an imaging biomarker, it should uh, represent the actual histopathology to as accurately as possible. Second is precision. That is, it refers to the repeatability or reproducibility, which would allow the measurement error from biological, which would allow to discriminate measurement error from biological change. Third is clinical validity. That's the, the results must be relevant to practice, impact patient care, and improve outcome. Now, in the era of precision medicine, quantitative imaging has become an increasingly common tool used for various applications, which is reflected in this chart, which shows a tremendous rise in number of publications in PubMed on quantitative imaging and CT in the past decade. Now, CT provides a wide range of quantitative imaging tools, such as two-dimensional measurements from conventional CT, which are useful for assessing burden of disease, or attenuation values, which are useful for tissue characterization. Multi-energy CT-based iodine quantification metrics allow assessment of tissue vascularity, or higher degree of image processing tools, such as radiomics or texture analysis, enable evaluation of features of in the images which are not visible to human eye. Now, all these metrics enable one to gather anatomic, functional, and molecular information from the diagnostic scans. Now, there are a number of different manual, semi-automated, and automated software solution and post-processing techniques which are available from various vendors which are capable of generating and processing the different CT quantitative metrics uh, to obtain meaningful data for clinical and research use. Now a detailed discussion of all these solutions are beyond the scope of this lecture. And I will limit this discussion during this lecture only from a clinical perspective. So the, for the sake of this discussion, I would like to categorize the applications of quantitative imaging in the abdomen into screening and risk assessment, guiding treatment decisions, and monitoring response and predicting outcome. Now, while there is an exhaustive list of applications in these three categories, I would like to focus on a few important ones from a perspective of an abdominal imager. So I want to begin with the role of CT as an opportunistic tool in screening and risk assessment and want to focus on three areas, screening for osteoporosis, determination of cardiovascular risk, and sarcopenia. Now, there has been a great deal of research exploring the role of CT as an opportunistic tool for screening in patients undergoing diagnostic CT for various different indications. I want to start here with the research efforts by Perry Picard, who is a pioneer in this realm. I will start with this early paper published by his group in Annals of Internal Medicine in 2013. Now, in this really thoughtful and innovative study, the investigators evaluated CT-derived bone mineral density assessment based on attenuation values and compared it with DEXA studies for identifying osteoporosis by using CT scans performed for other clinical indications. Now, they found that a threshold attenuation of 110 Hounsfield units obtained at L1 vertebral level provided 90% specificity for the diagnosis of osteoporosis as defined by the DEXA scan. 
Now, I have been using this in clinical practice for several years now and also teach my residents and fellows. Now, here is an example of a 72-year-old female undergoing CT in the setting of post-operative appendectomy. And at the level of L1, the density in the trabecular bone was 83 Hounsfield units, suggesting osteoporosis. And interestingly, you'll see here that there is an osteoporotic compression fracture in the upper end plate of L3 vertebral body. Now, the DEXA evaluation of the lumbar spine and hip in this same patient was also compatible with osteoporosis according to WHO criteria. Now, this and several similar studies demonstrate the value of CT as a tool to identify patients with osteoporosis on abdominal CT scan obtained for other reason, including screening studies such as CT colonography. Now, let's segue from bones to vessels. Picard and, his, uh, Picard and his group have also uh, extended the application of quantitative imaging to other sites. For example, in this study published in radiology, they studied if aortic calcification and abdominal CT could predict cardiovascular events. In a cohort of 829 patients undergoing CT colonography screen, they estimated that abdominal aortic calcification using a semi-automated tool quantified uh, and quantified it as a modified Agassan score. Now, they found that using a cutoff point of 200, a CT-based score improved Framingham risk categorization and concluded that CT-based abdominal aortic calcification was a strong predictor of future cardiovascular events, outperforming Framingham risk score, which is a gold standard for estimating 10-year cardiovascular risk for an individual. Again, I now routinely comment on coronary artery and aortic vascular calcification in my reports, sometime even putting them in the impression to alert the referring providers. Now, let's move on to body composition. Now, there has been a lot of interest lately in exploring other metrics made available by CT to predict risks and outcome. Now, these include body composition metrics, which refer to quantifying the compartmental distribution of fat and muscle within the body, including visceral adipose tissue, uh, abdominal subcutaneous adipose tissue volume, liver fat fraction, muscle group volumes such as thigh muscles, individual muscle volumes, and muscle infiltration. Now, one of the body composition metrics which has gained significant attention in the past decade is sarcopenia, which refers to reduction in skeletal muscle quantity and quality. Now, initially, this sarcopenia was considered as an age-related phenomenon. However, now it is being increasingly realized that sarcopenia can occur in younger patients. And as you can see in this small subset from the extensive research on this subject, there's increasing evidence that sarcopenia is considered a poor prognostic indicator across many diseases, especially in oncology. Now, here are two examples of patients with pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, and you can see the overall survival in the patient with more muscle mass on the left side, measured at the L3 vertebral level, was significantly higher compared to a patient with sarcopenia. Now, here I want to share two studies we performed at Mass General. In a collaborative study with your oncology colleagues, we investigated the relationship between sarcopenia and patients' quality of life. In a cohort of 237 patients, we found that sarcopenia was highly prevalent among patients with newly diagnosed incurable cancer, which accounted for nearly 50% of patients, and older patients had a higher likelihood of developing sarcopenia. Sarcopenia was associated with worse quality of life and greater depression symptoms, which highlights the need to address issue of sarcopenia early in the course of illness. In fact, there has been a rising request from our cancer center asking us to include details of patients' body composition, such as the muscle volume, in our routine radiology reports. Now, sarcopenia has also been associated with prognosis in non-oncological condition. Now, let's look at patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Now, in patients with ulcerative colitis, 25% of them develop severe flare during their lifetime, and despite medical rescue, 20% of patients require colectomy. Now, in a collaborative study with gastroenterologists, we analyzed the effect of sarcopenia and visceral ad adiposity on outcome in 89 patients with acute severe ulcerative colitis who underwent abdominal CT scan during their initial hospitalization. 
Now in this cohort, we found that a total of 44% of patients required some degree of medical rescue therapy or surgery. And a large proportion of these patients uh, had, who required rescue therapy had demonstrated sarcopenia. And we also found that sarcopenia was a predictor for need for rescue therapy or colectomy in hospitalized alter, uh, ulcerative colitis patients. Now, while these different quantitative imaging biomarkers, which I described, allow opportunistic uh, screening and risk assessments, combining these parameters has immense potential. For example, I mean, if you look at a different disease entity, uh, patients with stone disease, that is urolithiasis, there is increasing uh, realization now that urolithiasis is now considered part of a systemic disease. And there's growing evidence which shows that patients with stone disease also have other manifestations of metabolic syndrome, such as diabetes, uh, atherosclerosis, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, obesity, and coronary artery calcifications. Now, CT being a data-rich modality, a non-contrast CT performed for stone disease can be used to determine hepatic steatosis, body composition, vascular calcium uh, burden, and risk for osteoporosis. And this can be used to create a combined AI-based model to allow prediction of long-term cardiovascular mortality in patients undergoing scans for stone detection. Similarly, such AI-based quantitative imaging models can be now used in a wide range of patients undergoing CT for various reasons, including patients with NAFLD who have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, who, are at, who have been shown to be at increased risk for cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events due to their association with metabolic syndrome and liver-related events from cirrhosis. Now, these opportunities demonstrate that CT has a potential to be a powerful tool for risk prediction by harnessing the rich incidental CT body composition data, which is embedded in the routine abdominal scans we perform for a clinical benefit. Now, while developing such models can take time, maybe this is uh, expedited with the introduction of artificial intelligence uh, uh, techniques, what we can do on a routine basis in a clinical practice is identify these uh, 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 opportunistic uh, uh, abnormalities and put them in the, uh, in the report. Now, I want to share a study done at MGH here. In this interesting study, uh, where our radiology group, my mentor, Dushan Sahani, partnered with hepatology and primary care, and they tried to identify the rates of documentation of incidentally detected steatosis in primary care nodes. Now, this study included 127 adult patients undergoing abdominal CT with incidentally reported steatosis. And uh, these individuals also had one or more primary care appointments within 14 months. Interestingly, they found that documentation of steatosis with, within the impression of radiology reports had higher likelihood of primary care documentation. And such documentation was then associated with higher rates for evaluation of steatosis, as, uh, such as testing for aminotransferase levels, alcohol use screening, or hepatitis C screening. So they concluded that steatosis documentation in radiology reports, particularly in the impression, was associated with increased rates of uh, liver function testing, alcohol use, and hepatitis C screening. So as a, you know, uh, so, uh, uh, take home point from this lecture, you can see how much value just routine reporting of these uh, opportunistic uh, area uh, you know, screening methods can be done on a routine CT scan. And as my mentor, Peter Mueller, always taught me that what we say in our report is powerful and matters, and there can be no other study than this one, where they showed that putting a, a incidental finding like hepatitis, hepatic steatosis in the report can have such impact on patient management. Now, let's go back to quantitative imaging. Now, from screening and risk assessment uh, to the next application of guiding treatment decisions. Now, here I would like to focus on role of quantitative imaging in volumetric evaluation and lesion characterization. Now, let's start with volumetric evalu evaluation. Now, the ability of ultra-fast MDCT scanners to generate isotropic submillimeter data has enabled uh, volumetric evaluation of whole organs and various pathologies, which has enhanced role of imaging in guiding therapeutic strategies. 
Now, an important application of volumetric imaging is in living donors, especially liver donors, where the estimation of liver volume is an important step in their selection process. Now, CT is more commonly used for this purpose due to its high spatial resolution and isotropic imaging capabilities. Both manual and semi-automated segmentation techniques are now available to determine the lobar volume, which is crucial to ensure safety for both the donor as well as the recipient. For example, a remnant liver volume of 30% for the donor is considered a minimal threshold for transplantation, providing uh, there is absence of liver disease. Similarly, in liver trans renal transplantation, semi-automated estimation of cortical renal volume has been found to be a suitable alternative to scintigraphy for evaluation of renal donor to estimate split renal function and predict post-donor EGFR. From an oncological perspective, estimation of post-operative residual or future remnant liver volume is also essential in patients with liver tumors following portal vein embolization. Also in patients with primary or secondary hepatic malignancies, accurate estimation of tumor volume compared to the liver volume is important for surgical resection planning as well as planning of intra-arterial therapies such as CERT to estimate the Y90 dosing and to uh, such as to avoid liver dysfunction following therapy. Now, while volumetry has many applications in other areas of the abdomen, an emerging application is in patients with urolithiasis. Now, if you look at in patients with stone disease, among the various factors which impact urological management, stone burden assessment is an important one and is typically performed on CT using linear stone measurements. However, linear measurements are not suitable in irregularly contoured stones such as stagon calculi. Now, in such situations, measuring the stone volume eliminates this problem and technological advances uh, has allowed development of several threshold-based CAD algorithms and semi-automated methods, which allow rapid estimation of stone volume. Now, stone volume measured in such a way has been shown to be a significant predictor of treatment success at lithotripsy. It's similar to how quantitative imaging can have an impact with volumetric evaluation and guiding treatment decisions, Lesion characterization is an integral step in guiding treatment decisions. Now, this is particularly true for incidental OMAS. So changing gears now, among incidental OMAS, incidental adrenal nodules are encountered in 5% of abdominal CT scans. Now, adrenal adenomas, both functioning and non-functioning, represent 75% of the incidentally detected adrenal nodules. Unenhanced CT allows for quantification of lipid-rich adenomas. For example, nodules which measure less than or equal to 10 Hounsfield can, units can allow diagnosis of lipid-rich adenoma with a high degree of specificity. However, most of the adrenal nodules are detected on routine portal venous phase CT scan. And these patients often undergo a multiphasic adrenal mass protocol CT, which increases cost and radiation dose. Now, with that background, I want to segue on to discuss the role of dual energy CT in quantitative imaging. Now, dual energy CT, briefly, without going into details about the technique, now, this is a, tech, it's a fascinating technology which allows simultaneous scanning of patients and high and low energy. And when tissues are scanned at two different energies, different tissues behave differently. What basically dual energy CT algorithm do is they exploit the differential behavior of tissues at different energies and use the attenuation measurement uh, spectra as associated with different energies to create multi-material specific images. Now, when, you, when a patient undergoes a dual energy CT scan, there are multiple different image data sets that are generated. Thousands of different types of specific images can be generated. Now, from a quantitative imaging standpoint, I think four different image types are uh, important. The virtual unenhanced images, which are surrogate images for uh, surrogate uh, for uh, true unenhanced images. The iodine images, which show a representation of distribution of iodine within, within tissues. The effective atomic number images, which show the distribution of the atomic number of Z effective number of different materials within that scan and the monoenergetic images, which are simulated CT data sets, 
which resemble the CT images generated from scanning a patient with a monochromatic beam. Now let's see how each of these image data sets, their relevance to quantitative imaging. And we we'll start with the virtual unenhanced images and their role in incidental adrenal nodule detection. Now, as I discussed, using a, scanning a patient on a uh, dual energy CT scanners allow generation of virtual and enhanced images. And these virtual non-contrast images could replace true and enhanced CT, thereby reducing radiation dose and preventing additional scans. Now, here are two examples, which shows a lipid-rich adrenal adenoma and lipid-poor adenoma. You can see on the virtual and enhanced images, attenuation values is seven Hounsfield units. On the true and enhanced images, it's minus seven Hounsfield units. So with the Hounsfield value of less than 10 Hounsfield uh, uh, units, so this would be characterized as a lipid-rich adrenal adenoma. If you look at a lipid-poor adenoma, you can see how there is a concordance of the attenuation volumes on virtual and enhanced and true and enhanced values, allowing a virtual and enhanced image as a surrogate for the true non-contrast CT image. But if you notice the variation in the attenuation values between the true non-contrast and virtual non-contrast image was higher for a lipid-rich adrenal adenoma. Now, we investigated this, and what we found when we looked at 66 patients with uh, adrenal lesions, we found that the virtual and enhanced images on a patient scan, on patients scanned with the dual layer, dual energy CT, overestimated the attenuation in adrenal nodules. So if you use the same 10 Hounsfield cutoff for characterizing incidental adrenal nodules, you had low sensitivity for diagnosis of lipid-rich adenoma adenomas, but higher specificity. So now we came up with an adjusted threshold of 22 Hounsfield units, which allowed comparable sensitivity and specificity to the 10 Hounsfield cutoff from a conventional 120 kVp CT. Now at the, uh, while well, we are discussing the variation in the virtual and enhanced images, as opposed to true and enhanced images, we also looked at the uh, comparison between the virtual and enhanced images in a phantom and patient studies across the three different vendors. So we looked at 44 patients who underwent contrast and enhanced abdominal CT on all the three different scanners. And what interestingly, what we found was there were significant inter-scanner differences in the attenuation measurements and the qual qualitative assessment of virtual and enhanced images across different vendors. So there was either overestimation or underestimation of the virtual and enhanced attenuation values when compared to true unenhanced attenuation values. Now this becomes important because as more patients get scanned on dual energy CT scanners, it's important to be aware and cognizant of these variation in the quantitative values on virtual and enhanced images with dual energy CT. Now let's look at the other image data set generated from a dual energy CT scanner. That's the iodine images. Now you can also quantify the iodine on an iodine image. And this has been shown to have several clinical applications. For example, in the kidney, quantifying the iodine within renal lesions, within renal lesions allows you to differentiate between hemorrhagic cysts, which do not show enhancement, versus enhancing solid renal masses, such as papillary RCC, clear cell RCC, or oncocytomas. In fact, there are studies which show that using cutoff of the iodine concentration and enhancing solid renal masses can allow differentiation between clear cell RCC, papillary RCC, and oncocytoma. Similarly, in another body part, quantifying the iodine value within tissues, particularly in patients with inflammatory bowel disease and Crohn's disease, uh, Barry Dane from NYU showed that Normalized iodine measurements was an important tool in identifying active inflammation with higher sensitivity and accuracy than the routinely employed clinical scores. Now, this uh, points to the increased use of dual energy iodine density measurements for objective assessment of monitoring in Crohn's disease patients and assessment of activity in those patients or these expensive uh, immunomodulator drugs. Iodine quantification has also been used to differentiate between different types of uh, lymph node involvement. That is, for example, differentiating between uh, 
normal uh, non malignant lymph nodes versus those with lymph nodes with lymph nodal metastasis and also differentiating between uh, lymph nodal involvement in non hodgkin's lymphoma versus those with uh, metastasis from other malignancies for example in this study uh, lymph node metastasis from non hodgkin's lymphoma had higher iodine density than those with metastasis from melanoma now we also looked at mgh we looked at the variations in the iodine measurements across the three different vendors and interestingly what we found was that there was sig significant variability of the iodine concentration across repeated scans on patients on different D dual igct platforms that is we looked at patients who had scans on different dual igct scanners and looked for variability in their iodine measurements and we found that the variability of iodine concentration was more than the variability of attenuation measurements now this becomes important as more and more dual igct is being used in clinical practice to be aware of uh, these variations in iodine measurements when you are trying to quantify especially in oncological patients who are on different types of therapy with that now i want to move on to role of quantitative imaging in monitoring response and predicting outcome now here i want to particularly focus on how quantitation is integral to oncological imaging now in the past two decades there has been ne uh, nearly an explosion in the use of a range of novel therapies in the management of various cancers including tar targeted systemic treatment options such as anti angiogenic drugs and immunotherapeutic agents and various local regional op 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 options such as ablations and intraarterial therapies now this has led to the development of multiple standardized response assessment criteria from who to resist to irresist the goal of these being to ensure objective response assessment allow comparison across various institutions and sites and also bring about consistency in measurements now all these criteria is important are imaging based and rely on using imaging based metrics to assess response now whether these imaging based quantitative metrics uh, include linear bidimensional measurements for tumors such as in who criteria or unidimensional measurements in resist criteria or measuring enhancing tumor in m resist or e cell criteria all these highlight the value of quantitation of imaging particularly ct in determining treatment response in numerous oncological trials now technological advancements has also led uh, in imaging led to the development of additional metrics for measuring response such as tumor attenuation in choi criteria assessment of tumor vascularity using perfusion ct estimation of tumor iodine content using dual energy ct as i discussed earlier or the new fascinating field of radiomics now here i want to focus on iodine imaging and radiomics i won't go into the details of principles of uh, technique of dual energy ct but as we discussed the dual energy ct generated iodine maps now has led to the uh, uh, creation of a new sort of a metric called volumetric iodine uptake and this has emerged as a new uh, marker for uh, assessing tumor vascularity and also allowing response evaluation in anti angiogenic therapies some authors uh, have called this a quantitative metric and it has been shown to be useful in patients with hcc and rcc in hcc such quantitative iodine values have shown good correlation with perfusion measurements and also have demonstrated ability to evaluate disease control consistent with the current asld standards now as iodine is being increasingly used as a surrogate for tumor viability investigators have used iodine quantification as a, a tool to monitor response in patients in undergoing systemic anti angiogenic therapy in hypervascular malignancies such as rcc and various vendor based techniques are now available allowing determination of iodine concentration either in the 3d or the 2d mode but as i mentioned earlier it is important to be cognizant of the variations in the iodine measurements across different vendors now as multi energy ct enables superior uh, material characterization another application is in uric acid imaging 
Now, dual energy CT allows improved recognition and determination of uric acid volume in patients with gout. Now, I know uh, this is an, um, I'm showing um, CT of the hand. Uh, the only time you get to scan the hands in a, as an abdominal imager when the patient's hand is on the belly, but nevertheless, now dual energy CT enabled urate volume estimation has been shown to determine treatment response assessment in patients with gout, as well as to predict outcome and risk of flares. Now, uh, there is still no emerging application for this in the abdomen, particularly uh, there's not much on the estimation of uric acid, the volume of the uric acid stones in the kidney, but hopefully in near future, that might also be used for assessing response in patients with uric acid stones. Now I want to segue into the next topic in quantitative imaging that is radiomics. Now, there's a lot of buzz about radiomics. Now, if you look at the definition of radiomics, it is high throughput extraction and analysis of quantitative imaging features from medical imaging with the aim of generating predictive models to aid in clinical decision support. Now, as described by Rory et al, radiomics is essentially an integrated workflow from image acquisition over feature extraction to biomarker discovery. So basically, radiomics is an approach to extract and analyze various different imaging features and use them to predict, classify, monitor, or measure a clinical outcome. Now, machine learning and various deep learning methods provide the computational power needed to make radiomics more efficient. Now, there has been a dramatic rise in radiomic research in the CT in the past decade, exploring various imaging-based features in diagnosis, guiding treatment, and predicting outcome in a wide range of malignancies. Now, since at the heart of radiomics is the extraction of high-dimension feature data for quantification, Several radiomics features can be extracted using multiple different softwares. And these features can be divided into first order, second order, or higher order statistical outputs. Now the first order statistics describes the distribution of values of individual voxels without concern for spatial relationships. While the second order statistical descriptors describe the interrelationship between voxels with similar or dissimilar contrast values. Higher order statistical methods impose filter grids on the images to extract repetitive or non-repetitive patterns for, uh, for example, fractal analysis. Now here I wanna talk about texture analysis. Now texture analysis is an imaging biomarker which allows objective assessment and quantification of tumor spatial heterogeneity. CT texture analysis allows objective quantitative assessment of tumor heterogeneity by analyzing the distribution and relationship of pixel and voxel gray values in the image, which represents the biological heterogeneity and can be therefore used to improve diagnosis by lesion characterization, monitoring response to therapy and determining outcome. So when you basically use a texture analysis tools, you draw an ROI around the tumor that leads to generation of a set of histograms and numbers, which can be then tried to correlate with different clinical outcomes. Now, we at Mass General have used text analysis uh, for different tumor types. I'm going to share some of the data here. Now, in a phase two clinical trial of bevacizumab and radiotherapy in patients with soft tissue sarcoma, we studied CT texture analysis and compared it to tumor size, tumor density, and perfusion values. And we found that uh, changes in the CT texture parameter uh, MPP was the best biomarker for treatment response in soft tissue sarcoma, which showed significant correlation with necrosis at pathology. Similarly, in another retrospective of patients with stage four colorectal cancer, we explored the radiomics features as a potential biomarker to enable detection of BRAF mutation. And we found that two CT texture parameters, SD and MPP, were significantly lower in BRAF mutant tumors than in wild-type BRAF tumors. I want to share another research study we recently published. In this retrospective study, we looked at 215 patients who underwent neoadjuvant chemoradiation for locally as when rectal cancer and underwent a diagnostic portal venous phase CT. 
Now we looked at CT heterogeneity uh, using fractal dimension and uh, filtration histogram texture analysis. And we found that fractal dimension analysis on pretreatment CT was associated with response to neoadjuvant chemo radiation in patients with locally advanced rectal cancer. In fact, uh, we propose that fractal dimension is a promising biomarker for predicting uh, pathological complete response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy and may potentially help select patients for individualized therapy. Well, there are multiple research investigations which have demonstrated both oncological and non-oncological applications of radiomics. However, the CT app, uh, application of uh, CT radiomics in routine clinical practice is challenging due to a large number of data variables generated. Now, since AI can handle a large amount of data in oncology, AI provides the perfect opportunity to integrate CT radiomics with clinical data, such as CA levels, MELD score, et cetera, to predict treatment outcome and triage patients into complex and ex expensive systemic and local regional therapies. Now that has been uh, uh, much interest in the realm of oncology. With that uh, sort of a, a broad overview on the role of quantitative imaging in CT, I would like to summarize now. now I must say I've been spoiled a little bit with trying to give 12 and 15 minute lectures. Now it becomes hard to give a 45 minute or an hour lecture. Uh, but I've tried my best. So now basically to summarize, imaging-based quantitation provides objective measurement of current and future disease states. CT-based quantitative imaging tools have a wide range of applications such as screening and risk assessment, guiding treatment decisions, monitoring response and predicting outcome. Leveraging artificial intelligence to enhance quantitative imaging will enable seamless integration into clinical practice. And for that, we need for to develop robust, meaningful quantitative imaging bio biomarker that are vendor agnostic, uh, uh, ag agnostic of the acquisition parameters and can be compared to multiple centers. We need to do large cohort multi-center clinical trials. With that, uh, thank you for your kind attention. Uh, happy to take any questions now. Thank you so much, Avinash. Um, that was just outstanding. And uh, we have some questions. Uh, let me see. Um, I'll read the first one out in the chat box, and then we have something in the Q&A box. Um, so uh, Dr. Goodman, our chair, um, uh, thanks you for the excellent presentation. His question is, with quantitative imaging, are there any population difference problems? Um, could some of the quantitative uh, normal values differ with sex, race, et cetera? Oh, that's a um, terrific question, which is, I think we are just starting to scratch the surface of role of quantitative imaging in, um, uh, in various different clinical applications. This is something which uh, we have just started looking at. I don't know if there's any data available on the variability with population differences, but uh, I'm involved in a few projects with our clinical centers, uh, Center for Clinical Data Science, and we have started looking at this, especially the differences in race. Now, uh, I, I don't have any uh, data on this to share with you or uh, knowledge of what is happening out there, but that is definitely a very valid point as we are uh, trying to look into the, you know, the role of varying populations and how that is impacted by even imaging, like if you take mammography screening, screening for HCC, now there is variability on where the patient gets scanned. So now that is, yeah, of course, uh, maybe in five years, we'll have more data on that. We'll invite you back in five years or you hopefully sooner, but <laughs> you can talk about that. <laughs> Terrific, thanks, Alvin. There's another question um, and I'll read it out loud. Um, questions about, uh, well, I'll read it out. What is the status? I think you just froze. I'm sorry. I think my internet uh, got cut. Can you hear me now, Avinash? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the question is uh, asking about automated segmentation for body composition measurements. Are, are, are these um, like sarcopenia when you were doing the skeletal muscles? Are, is this something that can be automated readily or is it something you have to, I suppose, manually uh, do for your patients? 
A great question. Right now, we do it. Uh, it's sort of semi-automated in the sense we, we the we have uh, like there are uh, algorithms uh, which there are softwares which allow you to do it, but you need to make sure that it is it has picked up the right sites. Now the, the uh, there are several sites working on developing automated uh, body composition metrics. I think Perry Picard it's probably is the most uh, who has done a lot of work on that. Uh, if anybody is interested, there's actually a multi-center trial which will be started in a few months, which will try to uh, use a large data across United States uh, from different sites and try to see uh, how these different AI-based body composition methods can be used to identify and predict cardiovascular mortality. But right now, most of the tools, at least what we have at MGH is semi-automated. We are still working to develop an automated system for that. But soon, but I must tell you, a year back, the uh, Dave Ryan, the director of MGH Cancer Center, reached out to us saying that now they wanted all the, the you know, body composition measurements, especially sarcomenia in the clinical reports. They said, why can't you put it in reports? Because it's important for them, because when they are treating patients to use those metrics, you know, to decide uh, regarding, especially after we showed that uh, sarcopenia was associated with quality of life metrics, including mood. I know when you when you mentioned that uh, Avinash, I, <laughs> I was like, I don't want uh, our focus to get any any thoughts like this. Although I, I know it's important, but it's uh, it's a, it's a big ask, if, especially if it's not completely automated. Um, another question for you: um, of all the things you spoke of, you talked about a lot of things. Um, which are you routinely reporting in your dictations? Perhaps you personally, and maybe you, uh, you know, as division, like what are your standard things that you're reporting for the quantitative stuff that you talked about? So we do the bone density and I try to teach everyone um, now. So, you know, previously it's always used to be subjective, right? You look at the bones, you, you say it's likely osteopenic, but now with that measurement, I use a hundred Hounsfield units cut off. If it's less than that, then I say osteopenia or osteoporosis. Uh, hepatic steatosis, we routinely report that in the impression. Uh, vascular calcification, we look at the coronary artery calcification, aortic calcification, routinely report that in our reports. Now we actually have templates for that. Uh, we still don't uh, talk about muscle you know, mass in our reports because we don't have an automated system, but that's something in development. And hopefully within a year, that also will be integrated into our clinical practice. Um, yeah. And that'll be, a, that'll be an interesting one, I think. And if, if you start doing it, okay. it's possible other centers will ask for that as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, just another question, the questions are coming. Um, one of uh, my colleagues asked, any thoughts on how to prevent use of preventative or prognostic biomarkers on CT uh, provided in the report by life or disability insurance companies? Ah, well, that's a fascinating question. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't have an answer to that, but you're absolutely right. I mean, there is a, I mean, see, there are two elements to this. One, how do you charge for this, right? Now, uh, when we uh, when we get referring providers who ask us, why don't you put this in the reports? Of course, it takes time and money and effort to do all this and uh, it adds value to patient care. But how do you uh, charge for this? Now, I've, I've had some preliminary discussions. Now, the uh, thinking is... Uh, you add an additional code, like you have a 3D code for ultrasound when you do 3D processing, or when you do 3D for liver. You, so similarly, you add an additional code to your CT, which will say, okay, this body composition metrics were done for this um, patient. Now, what are the liability issues? So that is something which we need to think of as a community, as a radiology community, we need to think of, because uh, see, there's another question which was asked to us, which frequently our radiologists ask us, what if these are wrong? Who you who will you, you know? Uh, what if these AI tools which have measured sarcopenia or body composition are wrong? Then who is liable? The radiologist or the uh, the IT guy who developed that <laughs> technique? <laughs> yeah, so I don't have an answer to that question, but that's uh, uh, terrific. Yeah. I, I'd say the IT guy's responsible. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, another question for you, Avinash. Thank you for, for that answer. How do you routinely use dual energy CT in the abdomen, for example, for renal mass evaluation? Is it only for problem solving or do you do it in all your cases? 
Yeah, we might be a little outlier here. Uh, if you see from other sites which do dual energy CT, maybe uh, some of the major centers which do dual energy CT. Now, I must say among our 20 scanners, nine of the scanners are dual energy CT scanners. So, and majority of our oncology scans are get done on those dual energy CT scanners. So I might say 70% of our abdominal CTs are now done on dual energy scanners. So, so all our protocols have dual energy CT protocols. So I would say uh, any patients, any oncology patients, be it pancreatic protocol CT, liver protocol CT, renal mass protocol CT, a cancer follow-up, everything is done on a dual energy CT mode. So we use it uh, for renal mass evaluation, for pancreas, for bowel, uh, for kidneys, uh, yeah, for a ton of different applications. For renal stones, we do it. And so for something like renal mass, would you would you get um, a non-contrast CT as well, or would you just create your virtual non-cons and rely on that to, to, um, to diagnose, you know, enhancement and evaluate the lesion? Yeah, you know, when we, uh, so this is uh, it's also something which I have learned over the years. When in dual energy CT first came, I must have probably said that we can get rid of true and enhanced images, you know. But we have re now realized that the attenuation values, and that's why I spoke about quantitation with the virtual and enhanced images, is that there is still variability with true and enhanced images. So, in fact, there's a recent paper which got accepted in AGR from our group where we looked at renal mass comparing the virtual and enhanced and true and enhanced images. Uh, we found uh, if I'm accurate, we uh, wrongly categorized, I think between nine to 20% of simple cis and hemorrhagic cis as enhancing based on virtual and enhanced instead of using true and enhanced. Uh, that paper will be out soon, but yeah. So as we are learning, I think there still needs to be more advances in the technology for us to say fully that, you know what, we are not gonna use true and enhanced images. But of course, if a patient gets a single phase scan on a portal venous phase, and you can without doubt say, okay, this is no enhancement based on iodine images or virtual enhanced images. Yeah, I think you are uh, you could do that. But still, I don't think it's, uh, we have reached a stage where we can fully say that true and enhanced images can be replaced from virtual and enhanced images. We're still getting there. Uh, it, it's been um, humbling for me over the years, yes. Comment by uh, one of our colleagues to your point that, you know, for renal mass, the difference between even five to 10 Hounsful units is exactly. huge. And so that, yeah. that makes a big difference. Right? Yeah, so that, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's terrific. Um, just wait maybe a few more seconds. I don't see any other questions. Uh, and we're, we're I sort think of... there's another question on. Uh, oh, here we go. Yeah, you're right. Uh, detrimental effects of uh, accuracy of Hounsfield units in evaluation of osteoporosis as adrenal adenomas due to beam hardening from arms down or dense PO contrast. Yeah, I mean, uh, these are, uh, uh, yeah, when, when they do occur, it's obvious when you're able to see those, uh, you know, beam hardening. Um, we have not really looked into it, but uh, uh, yeah. I, I think it, I'm sure it does impact the attenuation values, but we have not looked at those. And of course, if we are not confident, then of course you need to get a standard scan. You know, if for example, if you see an incidental adrenal nodule and are not confident on the dual energy images that you can characterize them, you of course need to get an additional scans. Or in patients with the spinal fixation hardware, if you're not confident of the attenuation values, you because it's anyway an additional value you give um, based on um, evaluation of the CT images. Thanks so much. So it's 1.26. Uh, we are due to end at 1.30. There's four minutes left. Um, I can, I'm certainly happy to give you back four minutes of your time and <laughs> give everyone's um, their time back. Um, Avinash, I can't thank you enough. Uh, you know, we spoke about this last fall. I'm so happy to, I would have been much happier to see you in person, but I'm just, I am happy seeing you uh, virtually and you gave an uh, outstanding presentation. We learned a lot. Uh, we learned that there's a lot that we need to to look into and, and learn still, and uh, you left us thirsty for more. So thank you very much, and um, again, thank you for all of you for uh, for uh, speaking to us today.
thank you so much. No, I, 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 um, as I said, I'm honored for the invitation and I hope it was useful. As I said, I'm a little spoiled with trying to do 12 and 15 minute lectures every conference you go, you know, so I try to condense as much as I can. And yeah. yeah you thank nailed you it. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you.